Okay, so I had a few more questions, and we are kind of running short on, oh, not running short on time. We have a little bit of time, but I wanted to make sure I get to these questions. So, uh, you know, we, a few years ago, before COVID hit, we had put on a um, uh, an exhibition related to Isa alayhi salam. And, you know, what you do is we do training the night before for the du'at and some of the community members so that when people come and speak, they would know what they're talking about. So one question that came up over and over again was, who is Imran? So in the Quran, it's mentioned, right? For instance, Surah Ali Imran, okay? Then we have the, the you, know, uh, you know, who he was in terms of related to Maryam alayhi salam. But who is Imran? How do we understand who Imran was? And what does that have to do with the story of Isa alayhi salam? If you could help us out. Imran, on... as far as we know, as far as we understand from the Tafasir, uh, is uh, one of the ancestors of Maryam alayhi salam. And this Imran is not the father of Moses and his sister Mary. And, He's not the father. Uh, no, no. Th this, this is not the Imran being referred to. This oh, Imran. Referred to. You see, okay, okay. Right, right, right. Okay. You, you, you see, Imran was a very common name uh, among the Israelites. The Israelites continued to name the children after prophets, after pious predecessors for that matter. Okay. So they would always remember these names. Uh, in fact, some, some sometimes these names were used as a reference to distant ancestors. Mm. Okay, so both possibilities are open. But Imran, in this case, uh, as far as I remember, the Mufassirin, they, they are of the opinion that Imran was one of the ancestors, a close ancestor of Maryam alayhi salam. And uh, by that virtue, Maryam alayhi salam was one of the descendants of a man called Imran. Okay, mm. now when she's called the sister of Aaron in the Quran, uh, that was my uh, next some question, questions actually, actually raised this question. Uh, that was my next even question. Even at the time of the prophet. Sorry? That was my next question. <laughs> That's where I was yeah, going with I mean, this. <laughs> this is what it's, it's directly linked. It's directly linked. Um, when uh, Mughira bin Shu'aba, radiallahu an, was sent to Najran, one of the companions of the prophet, Mughira bin Shu'aba, yeah. was sent to the people of Najran to teach them um, about the Quran and Islam. Najran was a Christian city predominantly. Yep. And they, when they read the Quran or when they heard the Quran, they heard this verse, Ya Ukhta Harun. Okay. Uh, so they said, hold on. This Mary, the mother of Jesus, was not the sister of Harun, yeah. the brother of Moses. So this is uh, anachronism in the Quran. This is a mistake. This is an error. So Mughira bin Shu'aba, who was not a prophet of Allah, of course, he didn't have the answer. So he came back to the prophet in Medina, asking him this question. How... Is this possible? The Prophet said this was a reference of honor. This mm. is not a biological reference. This was a reference of honor to Mary. All the pious people in uh, or among the Israelites, all the pious people were referred to titles like this. Uh, sons of David, brothers of David, or daughters of David. For example, uh, there is another reference I completely forgot in the New Testament. A similar reference to one of the ladies who was called one of the daughters of David, but she was not a direct descendant of David. Okay, so she it, was called. No, I was going to say, isn't there also a reference to Elizabeth being the daughter of yes. Aaron? Right. Yeah, yeah. No. That's the, oh, sorry. That's the reference. This is the reference to Elizabeth, a uh, daughter of Aaron. Actually, not uh, daughter of David. She right. Elizabeth was not the daughter of Aaron. No. She was not a biological daughter. This was a reference of authority. This was a reference of honor. This was mm -hmm. a reference of genealogy, for that matter. Uh, more, more, more so spiritual genealogy than physical one, right? Mm -hmm. So any pious person, that's why, because Mary was a person of uh, mihrab. She was a person of piety. She was a person of zuhud. She spent a lot of time doing dhikr in seclusion. She was known for that. And for that reason, she was known as um, the sister of Harun or the, one of the sisters of Aaron because she was like Aaron. She was priestly. She was pious. She was uh, uh, an ascetic. And when she came with the child, they were shocked that how can someone like you, one of the sisters of Aaron or someone from that priestly class, come with something like this? A child when you, you're not even married? So hmm. this is exactly how the reference was used. So that issue, the sister of Aaron issue, is separate to the ancestry Imran. So Imran was one of the ancestors of Zakaria and Mary, 
if I'm not mistaken, if I remember correctly, because I read this in Tafasir, and the the reference to Aaron is actually a spiritual one rather than a physical one or biological one. But Imran definitely a biologic biologic. Ali Imran, the surah is called Ali Imran, is because right. Imran was one of the ancestors of these people, and these were very very common names. Okay, the actually uh, the Hebrew name is Amram, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, okay. it's not Imran. Imran right. is Arabized version of Amram or Amran, basically. Gotcha. So, um, so just to kind of uh, like add a layer to the discussion, I was reading um, what uh, Zamakhshiri says about the, these ayat. So he actually uh, presents that, in fact, the uh, he he tries to say that, if I'm remembering this correctly, that in fact there were two Imrans. And again, this is. And a lot of this, obviously, it comes from Israeliyat. So how do you really give a proper... It, you really can't. But it's interesting that he said that you had the father of... Um, you had the father of Maryam whose name was Imran. And then you also had the father of Musa and Harun whose name was also Imran. Yeah. So interesting enough, uh, Dr. Ali As-Salabi, in his book on Isa, salam, he makes an interesting observation. And he says that it's interesting that Allah... Uh, mentions the name of Maryam's father, if we consider this opinion correct, mentions the name of Maryam's father, Imran, but doesn't mention the name of her mother, which he says that when you look at lineage, lineage is always through the father. And so all of a sudden, there's an interesting paradigm shift when it comes to Isa, whose reference is to the mother, in, in the sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is linking the idea that lineage is always through the father, and that's why Imran's mentioned, but when it comes to Isa alayhi salam, only his mother's mentioned. This is just a that's, subtlety that... that, that, that uh, exactly. That's right? another, that may be another subtlety there, right? right. But the, the, the problem with Israelite tradition is that we cannot fully trust it. Right. Uh, that's unfortunately, we don't have any means to assess its authenticity um, other than itself, other than right. the text itself. And, and it's very difficult to use uh, an, an altered text to assess the... The, the authenticity and the veracity of the text itself. So right. that's the difficulty we have. But at face value, we have to believe that Imran was one of the ancestors and it, it wouldn't be surprising at all because Imran is just another name which is very common among the Israelites like right. Zechariah, uh, like Moshe, okay, right. like Shemuel, Shemuel, right. right? Like David, like Yeshua. These are very, I mean... There was a Yeshua, a companion of Moses. And mm -hmm. then we have Yeshua, Isa oh. salam, Jesus. He's right. also Yeshua, by the way. Right? So right. there are so many parallels. Even in the within, within the Bible, there are so many names mentioned for so many different people. Uh, and the names are exactly the same. Right. Okay, sometimes it becomes difficult to discern as to which David are we talking about here. Right? Because in the same story, you have few Davids. Right? So right. th th there are so many examples of names being repeated uh, within the Israelite uh, tradition, and it's not a it's not a surprise at all. It's like the name Abdullah today. It's name. Right. It's like uh, you know a Muslim name Muhammad, for example. There are millions of Muhammads around the world, right? So yeah. why wouldn't Israelites name the children Imran? So it's not yeah. a, a surprise at all in any in, right. in any sense. You know, I went to the. Uh, this reminded me of something totally unrelated, but I went to the gym the other day, and. Uh, you know, the guy, I, I told him, I said, you know, Ramadan's coming up. So obviously I don't want a full year membership. I just want to get my membership for the next few days. And then once Ramadan's done, or once it comes, I don't want to. So he says, um, he's, oh yeah, Ramadan. Yeah, I know about that. Um, you know, there's a guy that comes here. He goes, you know, he, he, you know, you know, Muhammad. And I was like, man, I know like 50 Muhammads, man. <laughs> like who's, how am I supposed to know who this random guy is? You know, anyway, it just reminded me what you mentioned. Um, you know, in Saudi Arabia, in Saudi Arabia, if people don't know you, they call you Muhammad. Yeah, they call you Muhammad. Yeah, Muhammad. <laughs> yes, I've gotten that. Right. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's the most common name in the Muslim world. Yeah. And, 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 and likewise, among the Israelites, there were yeah. certain common names that were used repeatedly for children. Right. There was, um, I think there's a narration or, or a version of the hadith you mentioned where the Prophet Sallallahu said something to the effect of that the, the people of old would name their children after prophets. You know, and so, and then I think it was in relation to the same idea of Ya Ukhti Harun, right? Like the, yes, so yes. he came to him and he says, the children, so from that, some scholars, I believe, have opined that Maryam alayhi salam had a brother, an actual brother named Harun. But my issue with that, just to kind of 
throw this out there, not that I, not that this really counts for anything, is that if there was a brother and he was pious, then it would be indicative of him being older than Maryam alayhi salam. But the issue was if if Maryam alayhi salam's mother already had a son, then why exactly. would he have another son, right? So it just kind of, exactly. I don't know. You see, if, you yeah. see this, is, this is what shows uh, this particular text, the Quran, to be divine. Why? This would be the answer Prophet would have given. If the Prophet was making things up from himself, he would have said, right. yeah, there was a brother called Harun. He didn't say that. He said, yeah. this was a reference of honor. Now, because of that hadith, we can't have that second opinion. Because right. the hadith makes it very clear. Mughira bin Shu'aba was told by the Prophet, this is a reference of honor. And mm -hmm. the Israelites used such references or similar references for pious people. And this is why Maryam was called what she was called. Ya Ukta Harun. Shabba. Yeah. Excellent. That answers the question quite clearly. It's very clear to me. The Prophet has already given an interpretation. So there's no need for another interpretation right. in this regard. Right. Yeah. Wow, very good. Okay, so I've got a, a few more points. And, and by the way, I want to, uh, you know, to our viewers out there, inshallah, um, if you guys have questions, if you could start posting them, you know, uh, we have uh, Sheikh Hanan with us today. So I'm having, I'm, I'm having a lot of fun picking his brains, alhamdulillah. Hopefully he won't get too sick of me and, and he'll join us again, inshallah. <laughs> but, inshallah. Uh, but if you guys have Always. questions as well, please post them, inshallah. Um, it's uh, definitely a great opportunity. And so while we're waiting for the questions, I'll continue on some of my other, um, by the way, I'm looking over here because I've written all of this on a, on a chalkboard, uh, <laughs> on a whiteboard, like all the questions I want to ask. So the other thing I wanted to kind of get into was the concept of salvation. And I know you've, you've debated, you know, certain people on this topic, but I think it's, it's very, in a sense, when we're making dawah to Christians, I think it's important for us to at least have a very clear understanding of obviously what our concept of salvation is and then what generally uh, Trinitarian Christians or you know the, the majority of the Christian world, whatever you want to say, what they believe that the idea of salvation is so that we can, you know, when we're making doubt and we understand kind of where they're coming from, you know? So if we could maybe start maybe a little bit, I know that's a very lengthy topic, but just kind of some tidbits and maybe some kind of key elements that could help us as du'at when we're talking about this. Okay, just to, just to summarize very quickly, uh, I had a debate with Dr. James White in the U.S., yeah. in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, if I'm not mistaken, January 2018. Uh, and the debate was titled, Do We Need the Cross for Salvation? Uh, mm -hmm. Do watch that debate and you might get some ideas from there as well. But to summarize very quickly, uh, it depends on how you define salvation. Salvation in Islam is not necessarily what Christians might think of salvation. Right. You see, their view or their perception or their conception of salvation may be completely different to ours. So one has to define as to what they mean by salvation. If you mean by salvation, eternal success, pleasure of God, entering paradise, eventually at the end of all your life here in this world and having been through recompense on the day of judgment uh, if that's what you mean by salvation then muslims as muslims we are guaranteed salvation so long as we die in islam in a state hmm. of faith if we right. die in a state of faith uh, if we die in iman for example we are guaranteed salvation a lot of the christian missionaries they spread this rumor or this misconception deliberately quite deliberately among the masses or the crowds that the muslims have no promise of salvation they have no salvation. They are doomed. Because they don't believe in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, they cannot possibly have salvation. But they are hmm. lying to their audiences. Hmm. We do have a promise of salvation. The Quran tells us, wa wa illa, uh, illa wa antum yep. Do not die unless you're a Muslim. What right. does that mean? That means right. if you die a Muslim, your sins, you will have to pay for them. But eventually you will enter paradise. You will hmm. enter God's protection. You will enter God's pleasure. Okay. You are a sinner. Everyone is a sinner. We will have to pay for our crimes. Okay. Uh, in some cases, more so than others. But eventually, so long as we died Muslims, so long as we died Muslims, even having committed sins, this is not to encourage sinning, but to highlight the point that so long as we die Muslims, we will enter paradise eventually. Right? right. But anyone who dies in a state of shirk or kufr has no salvation. Right. Anyone we believe... Uh, Anyone who believes in uh, the doctrine of the Trinity, for example, or anyone who worships idols, any, anyone who worships spirits and trees, 
is not going to enter paradise. God will not enter him into paradise. This is a promise of Allah in the mm. Quran. Allah will not forgive shirk. Allah has made it very clear. So long as we do not commit shirk, we die in a state of iman and we die as Muslims, we are guaranteed salvation, the Prophet told us. And very often Christian missionaries use this hadith of the Prophet where he said, even I don't know what's going to happen to me. Hmm. Okay. Right. But we say he's talking out of his humility. Hmm. He's not, he doesn't, he doesn't want to be proud and say, I'm guaranteed paradise. Of course, he's guaranteed paradise. He's the prophet of God. He's promising people paradise. He's telling right. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah, and uh, Sa'ad bin Abi Waqar. He's telling all these people that you are promised Jannah. Right. So how can he be promised Jannah? How can he be giving certificates of Jannah when he himself is not going to paradise? But right. he's speaking out of his humility that even I will enter Jannah through the mercy of Allah, not right. through my deeds necessarily. It is right. the mercy of Allah who has given us this life. Just like the Christians claim that every time the human Jesus speaks, he's speaking out of humility. It's not the divine Jesus speaking, it's the human speak. So likewise, <laughs> Prophet Muhammad, when he speaks in these terms, he's speaking in, you know, in humility rather than uh, speaking with pride. Right, right. MashaAllah. JazakAllah khair. You know, I was, um, so I, I don't, I don't really debate that often. I mean, you obviously you guys uh, in the UK, you're you're a lot more uh, adept to these sort of things. You know how to handle it. Um, so the, the I did do one debate with one of um, uh, I think it was William Lane Craig students, and okay. I may have texted you on that. Maybe I think you had advised me a few things, and I, I watched some of your material to prepare for it. And this issue came up. In fact, the guy had a list, and he said. Like he was, it was at like, I don't know, missionary.com or something. Who knows where he got it from, right? It just, so one of the points was we're guaranteed paradise and you guys aren't. And, you know, I was thinking, okay, so how am I going to answer that? And that morning I was reading an ayah in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, right? Say if the home of the hereafter is with Allah, in exclusion to all people, fatamanna ul maut. In kuntum so wish Absolutely. for death. So wish for death if you are speaking the truth, right? Absolutely. Now I I actually mentioned that I in the debate, and I said, look, let's just be very real. If your concept conception of paradise is like ours, why would you waste your time here? You have you know marriage and divorce and flat tires and problems with your kids and financial problems. Khalas, finishes. I'm not encouraging suicide, but the reality is is you intrinsically know that that's not true. And exactly. from, the Islamic, from the Islamic framework, when you look at people that are out in battles and things like that, they took that as a reality, right? That if we're going to be out on the battlefield and we're going to fight and we die in this path, they're able to do that, right? But ask yourself this, like, is it really true or is it just a, a, a cold that I have on my tongue? <laughs> and I think some of the brothers were a bit taken aback. They're like, whoa, that was really raw, man. <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't have said that. I said, look, man, it is what it is, man. That's at, at but the it end. It came of the from day. the heart. It came. That's you know? at, and that's what came to me at the moment. So, Allahu Alam. But uh, but no, and it's, it's a good point because I think a lot of um, Muslims also may have some confusion in this area, right? Like one of the other missionary tactics uh, they say is to ask the Muslim, "Are you entering paradise by your deeds, or are you entering by the mercy of God?" Right. This is one of your. Again, your missionary 101, how to trip up a Muslim. <laughs> you know? Yeah, we, we, res we respond to this question as follows. We, our deeds are actually a manifestation of the mercy of exactly. God. Exactly. Yep. yep. This, is how, this is how I respond to it. The fact yeah. that we are able to do the deeds we do yeah. is, uh, um, um, uh, is, is a sign that God is having mercy upon us. The fact that we pray yeah. to God, the fact that we do not commit shirk, and the fact that we do good deeds whenever we do, it is a sign of the mercy of God. So this wow. is how we enter paradise uh, by doing good deeds through the mercy of God. Yeah, yeah. The one, okay. um, the way I usually explain it actually comes from um, Ibn Rajab al Hanbali, and he has a a sharh of the hadith where uh, and I think you may have alluded to it a bit earlier. When uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, none of you will enter paradise by your deeds or something like this. And one companion, who, you know, I always think like he actually had some guts to ask the Prophet ﷺ this, right? He said, not even you, Rasulullah, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> so, Salam, so the Prophet ﷺ said, Wala ana, right? Not even me, unless Allah envelops me with his mercy, 
right? And then the hadith and that's the mercy, right? The, 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 you, yeah, you know, and, and Ibn Rajab comments on this, and he says that you know that you know if we enter paradise by the mercy, it's predicated upon doing good deeds, and he starts listing. The idea that whatever deed we do, it is a mercy from Allah that is given more credit and more weight than just a one-to-one -one accounting of the deed. So he gives examples exactly, of exactly my thought. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. And so it's we say we enter paradise by the mercy of Allah, but it's predicated upon doing good deeds which have more value than what they would if we just did them, you know, exactly. on our own. So and, and to put it in simple terms, uh, doing good deeds is a sign of Allah's mercy. Right. Right. The fact that Allah has is having mercy. Allah's mercy, does it, it's not an act, abstract concept. It is right. an actual concept. Yep. And that concept is uh, manifested in your good deeds. So yep. when Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Or yep. Muhammad, we sent you not except as a mercy for the world. What is he talking about? Is it an abstract point? Or is it a real point? The mercy manifests itself in your daily living as a Muslim. Yep. That's that's the mercy of Allah. The fact that you're being a Muslim, you're living as a Muslim. That's the mercy of Allah. And this is the mercy uh, that will take you to paradise eventually. Yeah. So that's the point. Brilliant. Brilliant, mashallah. Okay, I'm going to post a few of these questions. Uh, there's some good ones here. And we're, we're going to finish up uh, my time, 2.30. So we have another, uh, what is it, 19 minutes. Are you okay with that? Or I know it's late that's over fine. there. You're okay? That's fine. Let's go. Okay, yeah. I mean, things are usually chill in Pakistan anyway, so... <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I'm quite relaxed. <laughs> we're, we're, you guys don't have the same rat race that we have over here. So, alhamdulillah. Not, not at all. Alhamdulillah. All right. So we have this question that, wait, that's not it. Uh, let's see. This one here. So she, uh, Wolf Al-Hayani is asking, how do they know, and I'm assuming he's talking about Christians, how do they know if human Jesus is speaking or divine Jesus is speaking? Like, do they have a criteria or is it again the whole concept of theology that precedes text? Like how, how would how as a Christian how would you know which one's which? Okay, uh, when 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 Jesus appears to be denying the notion of his divinity, his alleged divinity, then it's the human Jesus speaking. And when there are some vague verses that allegedly point to some form of divinity then it is the God Jesus speaking, the God man speaking, right? Mm. This is our Christians judge. Unfortunately, this is exactly how it is uh, in practical terms. This is how Christians determine that it is the human Jesus. When he says, why do you call me good when there is only one good and that is God? That's the human Jesus speaking. Mm. I, can of, I can of my own self do nothing. It is the father's will I do. This is human Jesus speaking. Mm. Okay. Then, for example, when he says, Father is the only true God in John 17, verse 3, this is the human Jesus speaking. I right. ascend on to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. This is human Jesus speaking, unfortunately, right? Yes. But every time there are vague verses used in some sort of divine sense, that's the God Jesus speaking. This is how, unfortunately, <laughs> this is how the verses are interpreted. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, I think it does. So do you think that's a good point to bring up uh, when you're having conversations with Christians in the sense that, you know, if we're talking about whether the theology is correct or not, and you're giving evidence from the Bible, the problem with the Bible is that theology precedes the text. And so therefore you can't use it to prove your theology. It's almost like a circular. Exactly. Argument, right. Exactly. So so what what they do with the with the New Testament is esogesis, not exegesis. Oh, okay. So they read they read the theology into the text, oh, not the other way around. They do not read the theology out of the text. Okay? Right. They read the theology into the text. They superimpose the theology on onto the text, and hmm. this is called eisegesis in hermeneutic uh, 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 terms. So this is how, unfortunately, Christians have been using the text of the New Testament for centuries. Right, mashallah. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's interesting. I haven't heard that term before, but I'll definitely use it now from now on. <laughs> the difference between exegesis and esogesis, mashallah. So we have a comment here, by the way, not a question, but a little message for Adnan, Jazakallah Khair, for the work you put out. Uh, you played a big role in debunking Shiism for me and eventually averting to the Islam of the Quran and the Sunnah, mashallah. Jazakallah Khair. Alhamdulillah. May Allah Amen. bless you. May Allah continue to guide you. I mean, I mean, I mean. All right, here's another question. How do you understand the difference between the names Isa 
and Yeshua. And I'm, I'm, I'm using Isa, Arabic, so I don't know. <laughs> Isa is an Arabized form of Yeshua. Simple. Okay. Okay. The Quran borrows terms in an Arabized form. The Quran is indeed in Arabic, all of it. So what the Quran does, Quran uh, uses Arabized terms taken from uh, previous uh, civilizations. For example, uh, Fir'aun is an Arabized version of Para'a. Hmm. Okay? Uh, Para'a is basically uh, the term in ancient Egyptian. In hieroglyphs, uh, okay. this is how we read it, Para'a, right? But the Quran uses the term Fir'aun. Musa is an Arabized version of Moshe, for example. Hmm. Okay? And the list goes on. Injil is an Arabized version of Evangelion, right? Right. Torah is an Arabized version of Torah, right? So there are so many different examples. Likewise, Isa is an Arabized uh, uh, version of Yeshua. Hmm. Okay. So before I get to this next question, you actually reminded me of something. You know, from uh, obviously from the Islamic tradition, we know that there was a revelation that was given to Isa al -Islam, which we call the Injil. Do Christians um, think that there was a revelation that was given to Isa al -Islam? That's part one. And part two, is that which was given to Isa al -Islam, what they have as the Bible today? Is that the second part corollary of that belief? Because obviously when you talk about the Bible, they always say the inspired word of God, it was given to Matthew, Mark, Luke, they were inspired by God. Okay. But then was there something separate that was given to Isa alayhi salam according to their theology or there wasn't? You see, uh, there are references in the New Testament whereby it is stated that Jesus was preaching the gospel, not right. plural, not four gospels, not one of the gospels that were written later on, but right. he was preaching the gospel, right? right? Now, whether these four gospels contain the gospel is a very interesting question, but none of them actually claim to be the gospel hmm. none of them none of right. them these are gospels according to john matthew mark and luke right. okay these are and paul has his own gospel in his epistles right and paul was simply unaware completely unaware of these four gospels because they were not written so long as he was alive he died hmm. in 60 ce allegedly and the first gospel was written between 60 to 70 ce the gospel of mark right so right. paul was completely unaware of oh. these four gospels and these gospel authors never claim to be divinely inspired, by the way. This divine inspiration was superimposed on these four gospels later on uh, in the third century, to be precise. Okay. Mm -hmm. Previously, up to the second century, these four gospels were simply uh, treated as the memoirs of the apostles, not necessarily as scripture. Scripture mm -hmm. to the early Christians in the first and the second century meant the Old Testament, not the New Testament. There was no such thing as New Testament for as late as the late 3rd century. Wow. It took Christians nearly 300 years to come up with um, a collection of books that was that was later on called uh, uh, the New Testament. There was mm. no New Testament even in the mid-2nd century. There were books scattered all over the Christian world, right. okay, written by different people at different times in different places, but there was no such thing as new, the New Testament. Scripture, scripture strictly meant the Old Testament up to that point. Wow. So these were memoirs of the apostles in the second century. In the third century, they were given the status of scripture by the third century church fathers, to be precise. Right. Again, with the process of theology preceding uh, the script, the scripture. Exactly. Itself. Interesting. Exactly. All right. So now, next question. What books would Ustad Adnan Rashid recommend regarding Islamic history? Okay. Uh, Sheikh Ali is Salabi. Mm -hmm. One name. Yeah. Okay, his books have been translated into English and other languages. So, yeah. Sheikh Ali Muhammad al Salabi, his books are excellent treatments, uh, good places to start, inshallah, for beginners, definitely. So, so, I would just add to that, uh, you know, Dr. Ali al Salabi's books are excellent, especially if you can navigate the Arabic language. Uh, what I would say, however, is that some translations are really good, some translations are extremely bad. So, for example, there was a translation that I read on his book uh, related to um, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. The translation, it's unreadable. It's really bad. 
So you have was to it, be. Was it done in India or Pakistan? No, I'm not chance? sure. It's it's. Uh, I mean, I, I don't want to call the brothers out, but it was a Dar es Salaam publication, which is really yeah. strange, you know. Um, uh, but some yeah, of the I, 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 I would recommend IIT, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. IIT are a I think publisher. IIPH. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. IIPH. Yeah. IIPH. Their translations are good. Yes, they're very, good. they're very good. Yeah, so I would yeah. just say be careful with who's doing the translating because a lot, I mean, first of all, a lot of it will make sense. Uh, you know, so for myself, I just reverted back to the but to the Arabic. Um, so those are actually very, very good. In fact, he he wrote a book on Isa alayhi salam. I don't know if you've gotten a chance to look at it, but that's very good. I mean, I really thoroughly enjoyed it, uh, learned a lot from it, inshallah. Uh, and and I think there is a translation out there of the book as well. So if, if you are an absolute beginner, then I would strongly yeah. recommend uh, The Lost Islamic History by Firas al-Khatib. Ah, that's yes, a, yes. That's a very good book to start with. If you are an absolute beginner on Islamic history, then that's, that's the first book uh, I would strongly recommend, uh, The Lost Islamic History by Firas al-Khatib. A very good book. Mashallah. Do you have any books you would recommend um, related to the Christian tradition or like Dawah to Christians or some someone who's interested in, let's say, getting a uh, who's starting off in, in calling Christians to Islam? Was there, can you think okay. of it? Uh, you see, everyone has a different level of uh, reading and understanding. Sure. Uh, some people are not prone to, uh, how can I put it? They're not very good with academic works. Yeah. So recommending academic books may not be very good. But nevertheless, I will mention some names. The books of Giza Vermes, who was a Jewish scholar mm -hmm. on early Christianity. His books are excellent. Okay. Okay. Uh, then uh, there are other authors I would strongly recommend. Uh, some books are highly technical. I wouldn't like to recommend those books. But right. works by Bart Ehrman, for example, are very, sure. very good. Highly okay. readable works. Bart Ehrman. Although yep. Christians are generally allergic to that name, uh, but but <laughs> right. do read the the, the information. Uh, his books are excellent, excellent treatments of early Christianity. And apart from that, I would say read books by Sheikh Ahmad Didat and watch his videos, and you will get some basic knowledge uh, on Christianity. But don't necessarily use the same arguments because some of the arguments have been used; they've been exhausted. Right. right. So we really need to. Um, as they say, up our game. We really need to improve right. with our arguments and go sure. academic on everything, inshallah. Right, right, inshallah. Is there, so, so since we're on this question, since I have you, is there any books you would recommend for someone who would like to get started in uh, studying the history of Muslims in South Asia? Okay, uh, there is a book by Mujib. The author is Mujib, and the book is titled Indian Muslims. Oh, yeah, yeah. Actually, I remember you telling me about that. Alhamdulillah. I found it in yeah. your library. Alhamdulillah. That's, that's an excellent, that's yeah. an excellent uh, book. And, and there's another book by Jamal. By okay. Jamal. This is the surname. And the book is titled Islam in South Asia. Okay. Islam in South Asia. Okay. And Jamal. Yeah. Okay. And these books are written originally in English? Or they're Urdu yeah. books that are translated? No, okay. they, they, are, they are in English. They okay. are academic okay. books. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Yeah. Let's see what else we have. I, I wanted to get. Um, uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. So, so someone asked a few unrelated questions, but um, let's see. I'm having to scroll through these. Just give me one second. Um, and if you want to read in Mughals, there's another book titled uh, The Mughal Empire by F.F. F. Richards. There okay. is another excellent book recently authored by Richard Eaton. Eaton is E-A-T-O-N, Richard Eaton, and the book is titled India in Persianate Age. Huh, okay. India in Persianate Age. That's an excellent book. It's a very recent book. And also uh, look into the works of Audrey Trushk. Audrey Trushk. She has okay. written on Aurangzeb. She has recently written a book uh, on Muslim history in the Sanskrit sources. So these are some of the good works you can read. Hmm. All right. So I think this question is, I think we've already kind of answered it, but if you want to comment any further, but I think you've already done a pretty thorough job. Um, 
Uh, what does inspired by God mean? Does does that mean John, Matthew, Mark, Luke were prophets? In, in, in the Christian sense, it means uh, basically uh, these people are receiving revelation from God. And to Christians, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are prophets in really? that sense. Okay. They are prophets in that sense, right? Uh, so because they are delivering God's inspiration, they are receiving revelation from God. So in the Christian sense, that's what they mean. But when you read the text, you can clearly see contradictions, direct mathematical contradictions between them. So if the same God is inspiring all four of them, why is he inspiring them with different information? Hmm. Is the question. Why is the same God inspiring four different people with different information? What game so, is this God playing? Yeah. So what kind of response when you present this as Christians, what do they say? Like, how do they... There's no response. There is no response. I had a debate with Samuel Green on yeah. crucifixion, and okay. I put up the references. Uh, from these four Gospels on the question of crucifixion. Right. There is so much confusion on the details around the incident of conf uh, crucifixion. It is absolutely crazy. And I wow. ask this question, why is the same God inspiring these four different authors with different information to confuse the people? Why wow. could he not tell them all the same thing? Why hmm. give different information? This is, an an this is a question they haven't answered, not to my knowledge. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. All right, so let's see here. There's a lot, it seems to be like a nice long discussion going on online. Let's see what we have. Uh, so, yeah, it's more random discussion, so on and so forth. So I guess while we're, yeah, so while, if, if someone wants to post a question, go for it, but in the meantime, the uh, the concept of crucifixion. So that's one part we didn't really, we didn't get very deep into, you know? So maybe uh, in the few minutes that we have left, um, what is the general Christian belief when it comes to crucifixion? And, uh, you know, why is it so important to Christian theology? And, and I guess the... yeah, a third question to that, it, has that been the case from the very get-go? Meaning, do all Christian denominations, whether we're talking Catholics, Protestants, or we're talking about Coptic Christians, have they all kind of believed in A, that Jesus died on the cross, and then put so much emphasis on his connection with salvation? You see, this uh, question can be answered in a number of, uh, of in, in a multifaceted way. Uh, the answer, if you want an answer for pre Nicene Christianity, yeah. Uh, to be precise, Christianity before the year 325 CE, or if you want an answer for post-Nicene Christianity, then the answer would be different. Because most of these denominations you mentioned, the, pot, the, the Protestants and Catholics and the, the Copts and Greek Orthodox and Russian Orthodox and all of these denominations, Anglicans and etc., et Lutherans and everyone put together, they are all Nicene Christians. They mm. are Trinitarians. So right. they, uh, they are offshoots of... Uh, the Catholic Church. Some of them broke away from the Catholic Church, but mm. they took the Trinity from the Church, from the Catholic Church. But right. pre-Nicene Christianity was very, very diverse mm. in uh, the reading of their books. For example, they had different books from God. Uh, they canon the list of their authoritative books was uh, they, they were very often they were different. Their theologies were different. Their beliefs were different. Some of them believed in the crucifixion. Others did not. Some observed the law, the Jewish law, others did not. Some believed in one God, one person. They were strictly monotheistic. And some were binitarian. They believed in two gods. I mean, not two gods, one God manifested in two personalities, uh, the Father and the Son, and some became Trinitarians later on. Uh, the Holy Spirit was added into the binity, uh, and lo and behold, we had the Trinity. So uh, there were so many different theologies. When it comes to the issue of crucifixion, uh, this is strictly speaking Gentile Christianity. Hmm. This is what Paul had taught the Greeks. Uh, this is why you read the letters to Galatians and to Ephesians and to Romans, for example. These are letters written to Greek populations or Greek areas where people had come to believe in Jesus Christ. So Paul hmm. was strictly speaking preaching to the Greeks about a crucified Messiah. The Jews wouldn't buy it necessarily. Mm. The Jewish believers in Christ wouldn't buy this kind of stuff. 
the Greeks would believe anything because they believed in so many different mythologies and different gods and deities and all sorts of things. It would be easy for them to believe in this. But the Jews outrightly rejected this. This is why some of the early believers in Jesus Christ who were Jewish, who were Israelites, they claimed, you know, they claimed Paul was an apostate from the mm -hmm. law. Paul was simply a hypocrite to them. He was a murtad, literally, right. you know, because right. he was preaching uh, against the law or he was preaching to the Gentiles that they don't have to follow the Jewish law. But by that virtue, Paul was not trustworthy at all. That's why the Christianity we have today is essentially necessarily Gentile Christianity, not Israelite um, view on Jesus Christ. Right. So this right. is something very important to keep in mind. This is not a very simple question to um, answer, unfortunately. Right, right. No, Zakhla Khair, it looks uh we're actually out of time. And so for the other folks who had questions, inshallah, maybe we can take it next time. Uh, Shaykh Nan, Jazakallah Khair for your time. May Allah bless you. I know it's very late uh, mm -hmm. in Islamabad right now, probably way past midnight. So we're going to go ahead and let you go. Um, and so any parting advice, uh, you know, in terms of someone who's in, would like to make da'wah to Christians, any sort of parting advice, or just in general as the month of Ramadan comes, any sort of advice that you can give us, inshallah? In uh, two, two pieces of advice very quickly. When you do give da'wah to Christians, uh, please do read about them. Do understand their theology. And don't misrepresent their views. Uh, a lot of the brothers in their passion, uh, they're not very learned in Christian theology. Uh, for that reason, we advise them to learn about the Christian theology and Christian history. That way, your da'wah will be very effective. You can actually make sense of what you're saying. Uh, and this is why we advise you to be informed on Christian theology. Read basic books about Christian theology and Christian history. And then you can do da'wah effectively to Christians. And also, of course, learn about your own deen. Uh, you may be giving da'wah to Christians right. based upon the Bible and their history, and then you are questioned about your own faith, and you 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 fall flat on your face. It right. shouldn't be like that. So be informed. Uh, do da'wah with ilm, with knowledge. That's one advice. And start with basic books, and then make your way up. Uh, watch debates, dialogues, discussions online. They give you a lot of information. This is exactly how I started. I started watching uh, Sheikh Ahmad Idat's debates. And I used to take notes sitting in front of uh, this uh, old TV set with a VCR, with the VHS, VHS, VHS tapes. tapes back in the day, once upon <laughs> a time, <laughs> you know, in ancient period, uh, you know, when when there were dinosaurs walking around at that time, right? So um, I, I learned like that, okay? So no. this is the way to start. Start with dialogues and debates, watch videos online and then take notes and start reading the books I already recommended. Second advice is, in the month of Ramadan, please read at least one juice of the Qur'an a day. Finish it and try to read it with understanding. Your life will change, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. It's been a really enlightening session. I know I've benefited tremendously. May Allah bless you, bless your family, Amen. and accept from you all of the work that you're doing. And, uh, you know, it's it's been a real pleasure. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh Adnan. Thank you so much. Uh, and for, mine. Thank you so much. And for everyone that's here, uh, may Allah bless everyone that's here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open up your hearts. If this is if you're not Muslim and you're looking for, you know, the kind of the truth of reality and things like that, uh, we invite you to take a look at Islam uh, with an open heart and open mind. And of course, if you're Muslim, then may Allah bless you for your time and your and your and your and your attention and all of that. And may Allah accept from you, allow all of us to reach the month of Ramadan and accept all of the deeds that we would, inshallah, Allah would allow us to do in the month of Ramadan. Jazakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.